Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we've been working on a series entitled The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need, and this is lesson number 10 in that series for September 7 of 2019, entitled Living the Gospel. Living the Gospel, that sounds like a real challenge. Well, let's see what it has to say to us. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, once again we come before you asking your guidance, your direction, showing us the way we need to go and helping us to find out how we can reach out to those around us by really living the gospel. May we become more like Jesus each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I looked at this lesson and I concluded this lesson is really about motives. See what you think. Why do we do what we do? Are we seeking to earn our salvation? Why are we seeking to obey God's commands and His instructions? Is it for legalistic reasons? What needs to happen to a sinner to make him safe to save and I know that's a that's a message that some people don't want to hear sorry God cannot admit to heaven anyone who will just start the great controversy all over again so what can we learn from the life and death of Jesus that transforms us into people fit who uh, fit for the kingdom of heaven well, first of all, we need to notice that there is nothing we can possibly do to earn our salvation. Ellen White has spoken so clearly. Carrie? I ask, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith which is also the gift of God. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God, acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition would be rejected as treason. Standing in the presence of their Creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds His person, they are looking upon the Lamb of God given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation to be rejected of sinful men, to be despised, to be crucified. Who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice? This came from hmm. Faith and Works, page 24, paragraph 1. Wow. If we as Christians see a need and reach out to help the poor and needy, it is a result of of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is never a means to earn salvation. Everything we have, everything that we ever hope to be, we have because of God's kindness and gifts to us. We have received, we must give. There's a, an aspect of that famous verse found in John 3.16 that maybe we don't often think about. It says, For God loved the world. The original Greek word for the world is cosmos, meaning the world as a created, organized entity. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 929. So, that's really saying God loves everybody. He wants to love everybody. But not everybody wants to be loved, apparently. Look at Romans 8:20 20 through 23. What does this teach us about the broader issues in the plan of salvation? Charles? For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to that present time, all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. 
But it is not just creation alone that groans. We who have the spirit of, as the first of God's gifts, also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole being free. This is good news translation. Wow. So, let us be very clear. Salvation is a gift from God. When we permit God to enter our thoughts to work with us, He has the ability to transform us into His sons and daughters. We cannot do it by ourselves. He is the only one who could do it. This is not a matter of getting our sins forgiven. God is forgiveness personified. Remember Jesus Himself being nailed to the cross. And what does He say? Forgive them. Father, forgive them. And, of course, he couldn't say that unless he had forgiven them already himself. And they weren't asking for forgiveness. They weren't asking for forgiveness. That's exactly right. But salvation, I like to see it pointed out, that is healing. Mm-hmm. And uh, healing has to do with, with ch- a change of direction in your, in your way of thinking. It's your yeah. he- healing of your mind. Well, since the days of Martin Luther, the Christian world has had a fixation on forgiveness, which they have renamed justification. Martin Luther was so worried about his earlier life and what he thought was his terrible sins that coming from his Roman Catholic background, he was sure that God was going to punish him. Thus, he could only hope for God's forgiveness and thus he was hoping to escape punishment. Uh, So, how does God's judgment really work? Gordon? John 3.17 to 21 For God did not send his Son to the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light, and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Wow. And then John twelve forty seven to 48. If anyone hears my message and does not obey, I will not judge him. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. So, what does all that mean? People, God, people judge God. Uh-huh. Romans three four is a good example. And unfortunately, many translations, including the uh, uh, New International, have have changed it. It's mm-hmm. it's not correct. But uh, we judge God. Do we want to choose? to listen to God or do our, our own uh, self-centered way. And uh, the words I've spoken, like uh, Gordon just read, yeah. are etern- will be your judge. Yeah. Well, God's judgment is very transparent and is extremely fair. He simply opens the record or, book, or books in heaven, whatever they are, reveals what kind of people we are and asks if anybody has any questions. God knows all the details of our lives and understands where we are headed, even our motives. If we are seeking day by day to become more like Jesus Christ, then he will welcome us into his kingdom. If, on the other hand, our thoughts are only selfish, God cannot admit us to heaven because we would feel and be completely out of place. Another way to look at that, uh, we individually self-select. Do we want to listen or not? That's that's really the only requirement. Do we have a, a willingness to listen and take instruction or not? It, uh, God doesn't need to do anything and keep score. It's just we choose not to be there. Or and it, yeah, it's well, the 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 problem is we don't. If you just ask somebody, would you choose heaven or would you choose hell? I mean, everybody can say, oh, I, I want to go to heaven. So what what do we? What are we actually choosing? We're choosing to act in selfish ways rather than loving ways. That's That's sort of the bottom line of all this. God loves 
everyone and everything. He created a perfect world. He makes the sun rise on the good and the evil. He sends rain on everybody, Matthew 5, 48. Every breath happens only because of God's power. So, I'm going to propose something that might be a shock to some of you. The plan of salvation is not primarily about us. So many Christians believe that it is all about us. How do I get saved? And you too, of course. That's a very egocentric and selfish approach. The plan of salvation is really about God. And we say that we're talking about the great controversy. Everybody in the universe knows that we are sinners. There's no argument about that. We, should not, we, we don't have any right to argue about that. We know that's true. We need to understand the relationship between the plan of salvation and the great controversy. Satan has accused God of all sorts of terrible things which really describe Satan's character himself. As we read through the Bible, we need to see God's side and Satan's side clearly. If we have a clear understanding of the truth about God in contrast to the truth about Satan, we should be able to make correct choices. And here's a question I'd like you gentlemen to think about for a moment. If a person sees clearly what God is like, and they see clearly what Satan is like, would people all make the right choice? They will all make a choice. The question is, will they? <laughs> Many of them won't, apparently, because it says only a remnant are going to choose the, the right way. So, Is it because we are inherently selfish? We're all born that way. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, Jesus Christ are more than willing to help us if we are willing to give, an, give them an opportunity. The issue is not about our past sins. We can't do anything our pa about our past sins. God forgives them, they're done, it's gone. It's about our future behavior. If we are, when we are admitted to heaven, we are committed so much to the truth that it will be safe for us to live there forever then God will have no problem. If we are determined to go our own selfish way, God just can't. He just can't admit us. We all should feel the hurt, the sorrow, the tragedy that is plaguing our world. I mean, you, all you have to do is listen to the news and there's people being killed, there's floods, there's all kinds of terrible things going on. Um, that our people's lives are being destroyed, their property is being destroyed. You think God likes that? And, and people call it the act of God, yeah. unfortunately. Well, there are laments in the book of Psalms. There is weeping in the book of Jeremiah and in some of the other prophets. Jesus himself wept over the city of Jerusalem as he weeps over those of us who reject his appeals. Look at Matthew 9, 36. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Look at Matthew 14, 14. Jesus got out of the boat. When he saw the large crowd, his heart was filled with pity for them and he healed those who were ill. How much effort do you think that took? Did he just boop, 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 get well, get well, get well? I think at the end of the day, he was tired. He was tired. Yeah. Luke 19, 41 and 42. Jesus came closer to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. The time will come when your enemies will surround you with barricades, blockade you, and close in on you from every side. Oh boy. And then of course we think of John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. And I'm sure that you probably most of us here at least have been in times when children were asked to quote a Bible verse, Jesus wept. You know, because it's the shortest verse in the Bible. And actually it isn't if you go back to the original language, but that's not an issue for right now. Jesus must have lived a very disturbed life. I mean, 
everywhere he looked, there were problems and things which he realized that he could have done something about. And how, how, I mean, how would you respond to that kind of just unlimited need? There are people suffering. There are people who rejected him because he did not do what they wanted him to do in, in, in chasing out the Romans. And then there were all the sick people who wanted to be healed. And some verses you read that, I mean, people from nations around flocked to Jesus because he could heal them. Jesus also wept at the grave of one of his closest friends. Not because he did not know what he was about to do in raising him back to life, but because he recognized what the consequences would be soon thereafter in his own death. Why was the raising of Lazarus such a big deal? You remember? <laughs> the Pharisees and Sadducees, especially the Sadducees, decided we've got to kill this guy for sure. I mean, they made that decision before, but well, this up was to, even more. Up to this point, the Sadducees were a relatively small group, but they controlled most of what went on in the temple. And they thought, just well, just keep quiet. This guy will blow over. You know, he, he will disappear, something will happen, and this whole thing will just blow over. But when he attacked... Remember, the Sadducees did believe that there was a resurrection. Once you dead, died, you were dead forever. They didn't believe there was any life after death and so forth like this. And so when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in the presence of a huge company of people and many of them from Jerusalem, there's no way they could ignore it. So for the first time, they became all-out enemies of Christ. And the Pharisees have been wanting to kill Jesus for years already. So and now... yeah, Was Passover fairly close yeah. to happen? So people are already creeping, I mean, coming into... Probably not that close. Jerusalem. Uh, it's hard to know, but Jesus went back across the Jordan for a while before he came back for Passover. So probably... It was fairly close, though, yeah, but, but maybe close. people were not coming in. Yeah. But Caiaphas really... Yeah. He nailed it. He says it's expedient that one man should perish. Then the entire nation be destroyed. It, w it wasn't that we're going to be out of a job. It's really what they're saying. Who needs the, the, the temple system? Right. If somebody's out there healing the sick and raising the dead and feeding thousands of people with a couple of loaves and two fishes, uh, <laughs> you, you don't yeah. need it. And go back to add Luke 16 to that, mm -hmm. the, the <coughs> rich man and Lazarus, and then the, the rich guy says, hey, I got five brothers, warn them. And Jesus says, if they ha won't believe Moses and the prophets, even if somebody comes from the dead, it'll have no positive impact on them. Yeah. And that's what played out with, Lu uh, with Lazarus. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Hey, didn't have any positive in influence on the other them want to, It made them want to kill him. Yeah. 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 Now, I'm sure it did have a positive influence on people who, bigger, who, wider, who, who wanted to believe. But the the yeah. so-called thought leaders. Yeah. So, let us be very clear. Sin is evil. Sin is evil not because it makes God angry that we have disobeyed Him. Not at all. Sin is evil because it destroys us and breaks our relationship with God. Sin is always self-destructive. Well, sin pays its wage. Yeah. Death. Yeah. <laughs> Romans 6.23. Yeah. Carelessness, ignorance, prejudice, greed, selfishness, even covetousness are at the root of the world's evils. Injustice, poverty, and depression reign in many parts of our world. Before God can help us, we must be willing to admit our need. We need to take a very close look at ourselves. Now, we shouldn't spend a lot of time just looking at ourselves, but we are so good at deceiving ourselves about the truth. Human beings tend to be very, very good at self-deception. Uh, there's some words about that. Jim? Ephesians 2, 8-10 to For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ, Jesus, he has created for us 
a life of good deeds which he has already prepared for us to do. Good news Bible. So God has prepared for us a life of good deeds to do. How do we find out what God has prepared for us to do? Is there a textbook for that somewhere? Well, God created it's us in the Bible. Huh? It's called the it's called Bible. The Bible, okay. God created us and saved us so that we could cooperate with Him by living a life of good deeds and reaching out to others. God loves nothing more than to see one of the, us damaged sinners come back to Him. And where do I, where's the evidence for that? The Luke, um, Luke, prodigal son. Yeah, Luke 15. Two places in, the, in, in Luke 15, chapter verse 7 and verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just respectable people who do not need to repent. And then down in verse 10, as already mentioned, in the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. Joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. So, what is God's plan for us? Well, here's some words from Ellen White, the Ministry of Healing, page 103, paragraph 4. Those who receive are to impart to others. From every direction are coming calls for help. God calls upon men to minister gladly to their fellow men. So are we doing that? How does God convince us that sin is so self-destructive? What does He need to do to demonstrate that our self-centeredness our selfishness is so destructive. And Jesus has done everything possible to convince us of the truth and bring us back to himself. Uh, one other verse, First John three sixteen to 18 This is how we know what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Rich people who see a brother or sister in need yet close their hearts against them, cannot claim that they love God. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love, which shows itself in actions. So, throughout his ministry, Jesus sought to reach out to people like the Jews, people that the Jews traditionally rejected. Can you name a few? Women caught in adultery. Women with bad reputations. Tax collectors. Basically all women. Yeah, also. But especially the kind that Jesus took around with him. Yeah. <laughs> Samaritans. Yeah, Samaritans, lepers, Roman centurions, even religious leaders and children. And he was always generally warm and caring. Well, God had to go to extraordinary lengths to finally convince us, even his own disciples, that they needed to reach out to people in other parts of the world, people known as Gentiles. Oh, dear. And he didn't actually convince them until after his resurrection. That was pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Well, think of some times in the life of Jesus himself when he reached out to non-Jews. Think about the Samaritan woman in John 4. What did she do as soon as she sort of realized, began to realize who Jesus was? He went and told her. Friends. Went to the village. She even left her water pot sitting there. She ran to the village and she said, come and hear someone who told me everything I ever did. Now, I don't know how much the village knew about what her past was like, but, <laughs> you know... Mm. And the, think about the healing of the centurion servant. Remember the centurion said, what? Jesus said, well, let me come. And he said, no, no, you don't need to come to my house. I, I'm, I'm someone in charge. I'm in a large group of people. I send, I send people. I go here, do this, go there, do that, and so forth. You, you just say the word. And what was Jesus' response? Great is the faith. I have not seen faith like this in Israel. Great is his faith. A foreigner, a Roman centurion. 
And even more amazing, he's dealing with the two demoniacs on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Look at Romans 8, 20, 28 to 34. Matthew. I'm sorry, Matthew. I'm sorry, thinking about Romans here. When Jesus came to the territory of Gadara on the other side of the lake, he was met by two men who came out of the burial caves there. These men had demons in them, and they were so fierce that no one dared travel on that road. At once they screamed, What do you want with us, son? you son of God? Have you come to punish us before the right time? Not far away there was a large herd of pigs feeding. So the demons begged Jesus, If you're going to drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. I might add, I should have put the quotation in here, put the reference in here. Ellen White says that those pigs were owned by and sold by Jews. Go, Jesus told them. So they left and went off into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff and into the lake and was drowned. And I wonder, uh, how long would you have to wait before you dared to drink water from the Sea of Galilee? <laughs> it's a whole, a whole enormous herd of pigs is drowned in that water. Boy. The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and went into town where they told the whole story of what had happened to the men with the demons. And if we were reading over in, in Mark and in Luke, we would get the rest of this story. What, did, what happened to them? They went to Jesus and said, Please, let us go with you. What did Jesus tell them? Go and tell Go and tell people what has happened to you. Why was that important? When Jesus came back, there were thousands of people that were receptive. When the next time Jesus came back to that area, that was the time he fed the 4,000 who came out to see him. Because of the witness. Those, by the way, were the first Gentile missionaries. The first Gentile missionaries and the first missionaries to the Gentiles. Yes, both. Wow. And he traveled all the way up there near Tyre and Sidon to heal that demon-possessed daughter, that Canaanite woman. So, the Samaritan woman, was she a Jew? The Roman centurion, was he a Jew? The two demoniacs on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, were they Jews? The Canaanite woman, was she a Jew? No. What, Jesus must have been trying to get some kind of a message across. What do you suppose it was? We don't need to confine this message to the Jews. But I said earlier that it was after the resurrection that, that the Gentiles got that, um, that the disciples got that message. It was actually much later that they got that message. Years later. Years later. Even after Jesus' death and resurrection, years passed before the Christians began to spread out. And that only happened after the stoning of Stephen and severe persecution broke out. Look at Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his murder. That very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. And what happened? Well, then there was a story of Peter and the Roman centurion. You remember briefly that uh, Peter was down there staying in Joppa with a, a tanner. And he went up on the roof. He was hungry, waiting for the dinner to come. And what did he see? A vision. He saw a sheet coming down from heaven with all sorts of unclean creatures in it. And God said, what? Rise and eat. And Jesus, Peter said no, and pretty soon the sheet comes down again. Rise and eat. No, Peter, she, three times. I mean, was Peter quaking a little bit by the time? You know, how often do you say no to a revealed will? Of, I mean, a real revealed me- message from God. Well, anyway, some of us repeatedly do. I sinners see. repeatedly do. <coughs> and We're so, all what? Sinners. Did, what did Peter finally end up doing? He finally went with those men that came there, went to Caesarea Maritima, took with him six other people, six other Christians from Joppa. Why did he do that? He wanted witnesses. <laughs> he had to have witnesses. And, you know, it took that much. He had to go with all the, all those witnesses, had to travel all the way to Jerusalem to stand up for Peter. 
Peter, we've heard that you went into a Gentile's house and you ate with him. Well, yeah, but I have some witnesses here. Well, what did the witnesses see? They saw the outpouring of the Holy Spirit just as the Holy Spirit was poured out on us. Oh. I mean, I, I wish... <laughs> someday I'm looking forward to seeing a 3D movie of that <laughs> whole sequence. Well, the incredible thing is that even after that, and we've looked at this verse before, but look at me once again. Even after that, they were, they were not ready to go to the gospel take the gospel to Gentiles and tell what we have in Acts 11. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, and Cyrene is from, where is that city located? Libya. Libya. Went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And what happened? There was an explosion in the church in Antioch. A good explosion. Then Paul and Barnabas began their journeys into Gentile territory and the rest is history. So why is it so difficult for us as human beings to reach out to those of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds? Communication barriers, cultural differences, Prejudice. Yes. Prejudice. Carrie, I think you're the one who has some words about that. It's from Galatians 3, verses 28 and 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. How do you suppose the Gentiles who heard the, who received that written communication, how do you suppose the Jews, I'm sorry, how do you suppose the Jews responded to that? Descendants of Abraham? Mm-hmm. What are you talking a, about? This must be, what? This must be a typo. They it must, must be, that. yeah, there must be something wrong with it. This can't be true. Well, All of us must admit that we have the same Heavenly Father. We all are descended from Adam and Eve, even from Noah and his wife. Why do our cultural, linguistic, and color barriers prevent so many of us from doing what God wants? Wow. Prejudice. Well, look at Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We... Hopefully every Adventist is very familiar with these verses. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God, praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. It should say for Him to be judged as well. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. And we're supposed to carry that message to whom? Every race, tribe, language, and nation. Nobody's excused. And in those final three messages, God is making his final appeal to every race, tribe, language, and nation. We, of course, need to recognize that Satan is doing the same thing as spelled out in Revelation 13, 3 to 8. And how successful is Satan in his final appeal? The whole world follows him, except a few. Well, the whole earth, Revelation thirteen four. the whole earth, I'm sorry, three, the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. And who's the dragon? Satan himself. Satan himself. The day is coming, friends, when virtually the entire world, the entire world in which we live, will be literally Worshipping Satan. And what's God trying to do during that time? Trying to call us out of Babylon. Well, this will be an all-out war of ideas until Jesus comes back again. The appeal of the three angels' messages is to correctly understand God's judgment, which is fair, transparent, 
and redeeming to those who receive it. It appeals to us to worship the one who is worth it. And Isaiah had some words about that. Look at Isaiah 50, verses 6 and 7. I bared my back to those who beat me. Guess who that's talking about? I did not stop them when they insulted me, when they pulled out their hairs of my pulled out the hairs of my beard and spat in my face. But their insults cannot hurt me because the sovereign Lord gives me help. I brace myself to endure them. I know that I will not be disgraced for God is near and he will prove me innocent. Wow. In the final days of this earth's history, there will be a battle between the forces of Satan and the forces of God. Those who worship on the seventh day Sabbath will do so because... They believe God has created our world in seven days. They will worship him because he not only created us, but also has redeemed us, sending his son to live that absolutely unbelievable life and dying that horrific death for us. He died that terrible death to answer all the accusations and questions that Satan has raised down through the generations. Interestingly enough, I had just said a few words to a very prominent student here on campus today, and this is a student from another denomination, and she says, how do you explain that? And I actually had an opportunity to talk a little bit about the Great Controversy. See whether that it has an impact? Well, it will. You see, if, even if it shows very little now, I believe that in our lifetime, this issue is going to be crystal clear to everyone who can think around the world. God is doing everything he can to convince us how much he loves us and that love is the only way to run a universe. Charles? God claims the whole earth as his vineyard. Though now in the hands of the usurper, it belongs to God by redemption no less than by creation it is his for the whole world for the whole world Christ's sacrifice was made god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son john chapter 3 verse 16 it is through that one gift that every other is imparted to men daily the whole world receives blessing from god Every drop of rain, every ray of light shed on our unthankful race, every leaf and flower and fruit testifies to God's long forbearance and His great love. Ellen White, Christ's Object Lesson, page 301, paragraph 3 and 302. Okay. I want you to think about this. You open up a, not, a, a ripe, beautiful, tasty banana, and you take a bite, do you remember, do you think at that point, this is a gift from God? When you, every other fruit, every other vegetable, whatever, whatever fruit, uh, food that you like to eat, what, what should we think every time we take a, a, a delicious bite? This is a gift from God. Gordon, I think you have some words to add to that. Later in the same book, uh, Christ's Object Lessons, it says, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. All are bought nigh by his precious, are brought nigh by his precious blood. Uh, based on Galatians 3.28 and Ephesians 2.13. Whatever the difference in religious belief, a call from suffering humanity must be heard and answered must be heard and answered, okay? All around us are poor, tried souls that need sympathizing words and helpful deeds. There are widows who need sympathy and assistance. There are orphans whom Christ has bidden his followers receive as a trust from God. Too often these are pressed by, are passed by with neglect. They may be ragged, uncouth, and seemingly in every way unattractive, yet they are God's property. They have been bought with a price, and they are as precious in his sight as we are. They are members of God's great household and Christians as his, 
uh, and Christians as his stewards are responsible for them. Wow. Again, Christ Object Lessons 386 to 7. Yeah. And I work with people like that every day. Work in a low-income clinic not far from Loma Linda here, San Bernardino. And some people are not very attractive. And, it, you know, if you look at those people, it's the people who are least attractive and sometimes are, treat you the worst are probably the ones who need you the most. And that's, that's hard. That's, that's, that's tough. And often they're mentally ill as well as physically ill. Are we willing to take up the tasks that God has given us? Are we willing to let our lights shine in a sin-darkened world? Are we going to be brave enough to stand up for the truth when to do so will be at the risk of our lives? As we have seen through this series of lessons, there are a lot of people who are hurting. We need to find various ways to reach out to help them. Uh, and why, why are the hurting a special group we need to try to reach out to? They may be open for, for a different view, a different world paradigm. They are open to help. They're open to listen. They're open to someone, you know, who might be able to help them. They feel a need. Probably that's, to put it in the simplest terms, they feel a need. Well, we need to find various ways to reach out to help them. But at the same time, we must offer them the wonderful news of God's love and his salvation. So how do we do that in the most winsome possible way? Can we, can we look at the example of Jesus and get some clues about how we should relate? I mean, obviously we don't have the ability to miraculously heal people. We don't have the ability to raise people from the dead. Although I wouldn't put that beyond the realm of possibility when we, in the final events of this earth's history, I wouldn't be surprised at all if people are raised from the dead uh, to call attention to the truth, that God would do that actually to call attention to the truth. Um, well, this lesson is all about the love of God and how it impacts us in our day-by-day -day lives. We are all broken sinners. We need to recognize our brokenness and recognize that God is the only source of help that makes a difference. We have suggested before, and now let me repeat this idea now, we can't heal ourselves. Jesus talks about people who try to heal them, doctors who try to heal themselves. We can't heal ourselves. All we can do is give God the opportunity. We, by reading the Bible, by praying, by calling God to come in and assist us, what we're really doing is we're opening our minds to God's work in our lives. And God can make those changes. Well, God is the only source of help that makes a difference. When we experience that incredible love, it should motivate us to turn around and share that love with others. Are we doing that? Are we willing to do that? Let us never forget what God's original plan for us was. Jim? When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature, nature a likeness to his Maker. Wow. Education, page 15. One. What, what do you suppose that means? Physical, mental, and spiritual? There was no flaws. He had, Adam and Eve had no excuse mm -hmm. except that they exercised their freedom and chose to not listen to the words of the Creator. They chose to listen to the words of a, of a fraud. Okay, so does that mean that in the future, when in heaven, those who make it there will be restored into His image, physical, mental, and spiritual? I think that's the only way it's going to work I mean mm -hmm. <laughs> you know we have people have suggested when they when they've read this that Adam may have been as, as much as 15 feet tall so you know I would stand up at full, my full height I'm almost 6 feet 
and reach up to his belt. <laughs> Think about that. And he's less tall, Ellen White says, a little bit less tall than God, than Jesus himself. We'll be like little kids. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has done what is quite a remarkable job at reaching out to many, many different parts of the world with education and health institutions by the thousands. We operate almost 500 hospitals. And according to a recent count, 8,539 schools to help people physically and mentally. We also have many, many churches, many more churches, even more churches, trying to reach out to help people spiritually. But the ideal plan would be for us to combine physical healing, mental healing, spiritual healing in a single package. How, how, how do we do that? Unfortunately, we've tended to divide those efforts up. Is there an easy way to do physical, mental, and spiritual all together? She urged us to do so. I think during her time there were some restaurants going on. Mm -hmm. Yes, and she, uh, I have those, and I'm sure you know, this. there are passages that say every church should have a garden, should have... Uh, ways to reach out to the community throughout the week. Mm -hmm. Well, how can we provide a better, we call that a holistic message? We should even a a approach people socially. Uh, we need to be attractive and, and winsome. So many people in our world have rejected even the idea of God. Wow. Someone scribbled some graffiti in a New York subway saying, God is alive. He just doesn't want to get involved. So how do we convince people that God still cares and that he is desperately reaching out to, the, to touch them in their broken lives? We do that by being God's hands and his feet, by reaching out to people and, and, and you know, touching them in ways that are healing and caring, especially caring, so that people start to get the idea, that, yeah, there are people who really do care. Well, there are some very challenging words, words from Ellen White, found in Desire of Ages, page 504, and I think we, we need to think about these very seriously. Unless there is practical self-sacrifice for the good of others, in the family circle, in the neighborhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, then whatever else, what, then whatever our profession, we are not Christians. Mm. Mm. We are not Christians. Well, try to, and I mean, obviously, a Christian. Who is a Christian? Someone who tries to be like Jesus. And obviously, Jesus did all those things. Try to imagine the turmoil that went on in the minds of the disciples when they finally realized that Jesus was not there as the Messiah to help them overthrow the Romans. When do you suppose that happened? I want to think it happened after the cross. After the cross? Yes, sir. Okay. How long after the cross would you say? You think it happened on the following Sunday when Jesus? I don't came? think it happened on the Sea of Tiberias. I I want to think it happened when they looked up and he's gone. Okay. Anybody else have a different idea? I think even at the resurrection, I think they probably figured out that there was something that's not quite right. Well. Not the resurrection, because they still didn't believe it for at least 12 hours, probably close to 20 hours. Well, they realized that there was a problem with their version of beating the Romans when Jesus was, when they realized Jesus was dead. So it, I'm sure it was a... I think all of these ideas are correct. I'm sure they begin... How can he help us? How can he be the king if he's dead? Well, he comes back and he goes to heaven. Oh, 
So how is he going to do it from up there? Oh, maybe he has a different idea about what he came for. <laughs> even even on uh, when they knew that they uh, get the grave was empty, mm -hmm. and um, uh, John chapter twenty first, boys, I'm sorry I misled you. I'm going to go fish. Peter. So maybe it happened at Pentecost. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> there they went through an incredible transformation from the time of Jesus's crucifixion to the Pentecost. They were just so try to imagine th that turmoil. Um, how long did it take for them to realize that their challenge was to reach out to a broken world to teach them about God's love and His plan of salvation? Obviously, it didn't happen overnight. We know that it didn't happen fully until more than three years later. Well, God himself will always do what is right. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 68. God will do what is right. He will bring suffering on those who made you suffer. He will give relief to you who suffer and to us as well. He will do this when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven with his mighty angels with a flaming fire to punish those who reject God and who do not obey the good news about our Lord Jesus. Whoa, does God do that kind of stuff? Hmm. Well, uh, I think we have time. Let me read a couple, another verse. Ephesians 2. In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. <clears throat> At that time you followed the world's evil way, you obeyed the rule of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires, doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our own in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of of his grace and the love he showed us in Christ Jesus. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Wow. Do we recognize what an incredible sacrifice it was for God to send his Son? here to live among us as human beings? Do you appreciate what he's done for us? I mean, way back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 37, there's that prophecy about the dry bones. Does heaven look down on us and think that we're as hopeless as a field full of dry bones? Are we willing to put our lives on the line to reach out to others who desperately need to hear the truth? The everlasting gospel is an all-inclusive gospel because it's for how many people? Oh. Everyone. John 3.16 And then there's these famous verses, 2 Corinthians 5. I want to read these once again. We are ruled by the love of Christ now that we recognize that one man died for everyone, which means that all share in his death. He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and, were raised to, and who was raised to life for their sake. No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards, even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards. We no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done for, by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that Christ was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins and he has given us a message which tells us how he makes them, uh, make them how we are to make them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, so God himself were making his appeal to us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. 
Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. Wow. There's another quotation. Gary? Yes. The world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental and spiritual, can be accomplished. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. A Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. That came from Ministry of Healing, page 143, 2-3. Could we do that? Would we? Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Would we dare to say something like that? Well, maybe so. Charles, you have some final words for us? One of the strongest uh, statements by, made by Ellen White. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is loving and lovable Christian. Wow. Ministry of Healing again, 470, and Councils on Sabbath School Work. A loving and lo- lovable Christian. And if we're not doing that, we're not behaving like that, if we're not behaving like Jesus Christ, we're what? We're not Christians. That's what we read. I, I don't think there's anything else to say about this lesson except that the challenge has been set before us. There's no question about that. Are we ready to pick up our crosses and do what needs to be done? How difficult is it in our world today to live a truly Christian life? Is it really beyond our capacity? Is it really too difficult for us to be nice to our neighbors? Is it too difficult for us to say wonderful things even to the people at the store, to to represent God in every way we can? Let's try in this week to see what difference that might make if we do it. Our kind and loving Father, we have read some very challenging words in this lesson. Some words that should make us sit up and take notice, that should inspire us to become more like you. May that be our experience this week as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.